When Captain Sutter's pick and shovel uncovered that rich vein of gold in California over a century ago, rumblings of ox carts and countless covered wagons filled with pioneer families toiled their way westward in search of gold. The glitter of gold drove their excitement to fever pitch in those Barbary Coast days, but never so high as the fervor which compelled victory-crazed Iowa football fans for the thousands to travel in 1957. Excitement grew into mass hysteria as Iowa won the Big Ten title and Rose Bowl bid, and with only a short time to prepare, the rush and confusion of the 1840s paled by comparison. This year they went individually by families and small groups and in large well-planned tours by car, by plane, by train. The old gold rush of 1957 was on. The Hawks flight was to be from Cedar Rapids, Pasadena bound. But unpredictable Iowa weather brought on a thick fog and the planes were grounded. But it was a warm send-off up at Cedar Rapids. All eastern Iowa seemed to join Cedar Rapids to wish the Hawks good luck. And keys to the city of Cedar Rapids were presented to our team and coaches. A change of plan sent the team to Moline by bus. Freddie Harris shoots the departure. Herky was there to say so long. A last-minute word from Don Suki. Sign here, please. And Mike Hagler just made it. Already six hours have passed and only 55 miles from Iowa City. But the green light at Moline boarded the Hawks skyward on the Rose Bowl special. And pretty soon the whir of the motors was wonderful music to that tired Hawkeye party. The snow and cold of the Midwest gradually disappeared as the California climate beckons. The party relaxes a short five hours from destination, Pasadena. Evie thanks the tournament committee at the Huntington reception. And a bright spot was the presence of the beautiful queen and court in their traditional orange shower. Mitzi Lee Albertson on the left turned out to be a former Estreville, Iowa girl. The reception was fine, and the team went right to work the next day, traveling the round trip daily by bus. The journey was actually 12 miles each way. And here's beautiful East Los Angeles Junior College. This provided excellent practice facilities for the Hawkeyes preparing for that game January 1st. It was just about 75 degrees the day of opening practice for our Hawkeyes. And Evie introduced all his players and his system. Hundreds of pictures were taken by press, radio, and television. And it seemed that the players were all pretty much in demand. Line coach Bob Flora, team physician Dr. W.D. Paul, and scout and center coach Arch Kodras watched proceedings. Several individuals were called over, and the team ran plays for the interested spectators, showing the many variations of our balanced line attack. Team manager Bill Krause looks on. Coaches Jerry Burns and Jerry Hilgenberg were all ready to go to work. More plays, and actually, Evie explained everything. Raleigh Williams didn't have too many opportunities to take it easy. And the consensus was that Evie pleased the press and public very well with opening day practice. And Iowa faculty representative Dr. Robert Ray joins Mr. Leishman, John Bigger, Dr. Breckler, and Bill Nicholas discussing plans. 
Director of University Relations Jim Jordan and Lowell McAdam and Mr. Leishman had to work out problems of transportation and coordination while the Iowa Party was in California. Tournament headquarters, the nerve center of Rose Bowl planning and preparations, is busy all year. There is only one salaried tournament official in the 150 Pasadena businessmen who donate their time. Deep in the Arroyo Seco lies the Rose Bowl Stadium. Rugged and concrete, it seats upwards of 100,000. And yearly, the classic game is viewed by capacity crowds and millions more on television. The towering San Gabriel Mountains provide a truly inspiring background to the historic, fabulous Rose Bowl. The palatial, beautiful Huntington Sheraton was headquarters for the team and most of the Iowa party in Pasadena. Mrs. Jerry Burns and son Mike enjoy the sunshine and beauty on the grounds. And the picture bridge at the Huntington was a landmark for all to enjoy. Mrs. Buzz Graham takes an opportunity to record the occasion on film with daughters Sherry and Connie. The swimming pool was a popular spot to while away some spare time. Mrs. Evashevsky, Mrs. Bump Elliott, and Mrs. Eric Wilson are soon joined by Marion and Tom Evashevsky. Actually, the little ones needed supervision, but that heated pool certainly was a delight. The temperature remained in the 70s during the entire stay. Sometimes it got in the 80s. Mrs. Archie Codrus basked in the sun with son Bob at the water's edge. And then Mary Jo Codrus joins the party in the pool. Still two more youngsters put on their suits and take to the water. Then here comes Stevie Breckler jumping in the pool. On the far side we see the younger son of Bump Elliott and Mrs. Elliott lends a helping hand. Mrs. Whitey Pirro joins the group. Mrs. Burns takes a dip. Dr. Bob Ray takes advantage of the sunshine for a bit of photography with daughter Jenny Lou. Yes, you can all see the Huntington Pool, obviously, was the bright spot for the mothers and the kitties. Lots of fun. Mrs. W.D. Paul and Mrs. Lynn Welcher discussed the trip, sunny weather, and plans for the days ahead. Speaking of plans, shopping at Pasadena and Los Angeles was on the agenda of many wives during our pleasant stay on the coast. Mrs. Paul Breckler has chosen Bullocks in Pasadena. Lake Avenue in Pasadena was a mecca for shoppers. And it seems that Mrs. Breckler's tour was a success. Christmas was just a few days away and many happy surprises were in store for our party. The wonders of Disneyland. Well, the adults were just as fascinated as the young ones inspecting this land of make-believe. Because of the practice periods needed in preparing for the game with Oregon State, this was the only squad tour taken during the daytime. And this was one of the tours most highly recommended by our hosts on the Tournament of Roses committees. Still more beauty was added when Queen Anne Mossberg and her lovely court made a belated appearance. Actually, our entire party were guests on this occasion of the creator of Disneyland, Walt Disney. This extravaganza was appreciated even more by those of the party who actually saw everything. Disneyland, long a fantasy, suddenly became a reality. Archie Codris had a field day with his camera.
The Pirro family had a real big day. Whitey seemed just a little bit tight. An occasional rest was certainly appreciated. Mrs. Ray and Mrs. Breckler watched Paul Breckler and Stevie Breckler high aloft. And by the looks on their faces, it was quite hard to determine whether Disneyland was more popular with the adults or with the kiddies. Actually, our party separated often as favorite sites were searched for. Alex and Bob took a breather and gazed down Main Street, USA in Disneyland. The party agreed one of the finest meals of the California visit was at Walt Disney's restaurant. And the party didn't actually miss many of the sights. Frontierland was highlighted with the appearance of the famed riverboat, the Mark Twain just rounding the bend. This huge replica, symbol of an era, was one of the high spots of the day. Life-size, ornate and thrilling. Many boarded the vessel and relived the days on the Mississippi River. One could almost hear the twang of the banjo, watch the river gamblers, Many boarded the Mark Twain for a short ride. You could hear the swish of the paddle wheel. Adventureland in Disneyland. It seemed there wasn't time in one day to see and try everything, but we tried. The Floras joined the fun, and there was lots of that. Good humor, good times, was omnipresent. Sunset at Disneyland marked the end of the day for our Hawkeye tour. We all agreed it was great. The Hawkeyes visit the Ray Anthony National Television Show on a Friday night. Front row seats were provided for our players. And we even saw the commercial side of a national television operation. Dancing and music on the Ray Anthony show provided one of the most interesting evenings. Our opponents for New Year's Day were Oregon State's Beavers, and we watched them work out on press day in Santa Monica. Dick Cullum of Minneapolis and Sec Taylor of Des Moines chat with coach Tommy Prothro, Oregon State's great halfback, Ernell Durden, and a look at All-American lineman, John Witte. Some of the football players met their wives in Oldsmobile style down at the station in Alhambra. The date was December 23rd. It was on a Sunday and the players were there to greet them. There were 10 wives in the party at Alhambra. They reported the trip to have been exciting and the weather at Alhambra just perfect. Enough luggage here to last through New Year's. Most of the players stopped off at church before returning to headquarters. Pasadena has many fine churches. Our cameraman stops off at the Presbyterian Church right after services. And we saw Hawkeye's Fred Harris, Jim Willett, Roy Capitelli and wives among the throng leaving services. There were just 10 days remaining before the big game. Many friends joined some of our Iowa players leaving services at St. Philip's Church, also in Pasadena. Jimmy Gibbons, 
Bill Krause, Bill Stifter were all in attendance. And some friends stopped by to visit with our gang. Del Cleaver later joins our party. Well, Hollywood wasn't overlooked either. One of the show places on the coast, Frank Senna's famed Moulin Rouge hosted our Hawkeyes one late afternoon. A fine dinner and spectacular floor show was on the agenda for the boys. Still another national television show invited our Hawkeyes the Lawrence Welk Show. Evie and Tommy Prothrow in the audience, in front of them, Queen Anne and her court. And later the coaches pose with TV singing star, Alice Lahn. 1,800 miles away from home at Christmas, but this is one our boys won't forget. These beautiful black and gold watches were gifts to the boys and staff from the Department of Athletics. The ever thoughtful Tournament of Roses hosts had a special Christmas party. John Burroughs enjoyed a gag or two and special acts drew laughs and applause from the appreciative Hawkeye party. The Tournament of Roses had binoculars as Christmas gifts and made all the more attractive when presented personally by Queen Anne and the lovely girls. Everyone felt very much at home on Christmas, even without the snow and cold. One of the last groups of the official party arrived at Burbank Airport. The huge plane provided the first air flight for many in this group. The temperature was considerably different from their departure from Iowa. Among those arriving was Governor-elect Herschel Lovelace, State Representative Scott Swisher, Dean Mayen of the Athletic Board and Mr. and Mrs. Willard Archie all leave the plane. The exodus of Iowans was almost complete as alumni and student trains arrive at the Los Angeles Union Station. There were just five days remaining now before game time with Oregon State in the Rose Bowl. Tournament of Roses Vice President John Bigger greets Provost Harvey Davis and Mrs. Davis. Dr. Davis represented President Virgil M. Hancher. Chief Justice Thompson, State Senator D.C. Nolan, and former Iowa Cityan Harold Vestermark. Then we had the arrival of the student train, and this made our Iowa students, alumni, and official parties all safely in California. Evie received an award as Coach of the Year from the Los Angeles Times at their annual sports dinner. Paul Zimmerman, sports editor of the LA Times, makes a presentation. The leading sports figures of America were there in Hollywood's famed Palladium. The coronation of Anne Mossberg as queen of the Tournament of Roses was very colorful and inspiring. Queen Anne was royal in every respect. As the day of the big game neared, the Iowa party really soaked up the California sunshine around that popular pool at the Huntington. Even with all the basking, the main topic in the hotel and lobby was the big game. Just days away now, we were actually counting the hours. Buzz Graham, business manager of athletics, gives a final check to Rose Bowl tickets for members of the official party. Mrs. Bucky O'Connor and business manager Elwin Jolliffe and wife Helen like the sunshine on the patio. Dean Allen Dakin, Dean Dawson wife, and Mrs. Robert Ray and family get a chance to chat a moment. Chairman of the Board and Control of Athletics, Dr. George Easton, is joined by Miss SUI, Sandy Lohner, on a sunny walk out at the Huntington. Ken Plain and Alex Kara step up to say hello between practice sessions. Evie spends a spare moment with son Tom before dinner on the lawn at the Huntington. And Bump Elliott gets his mind off the game just a moment with sons Bob and Bill. Trainer Doyle Alsop talks football with boys in the Iowa party on the patio over to Huntington. The coach's boys seem pretty interested. 
Billy Happel has a moment, and the Hilgenbergs relax as they have a respite before the evening meal. It seemed that everyone had people to see, new experiences to relate, the excitement was mounting. Many of the parents of the players made the long trip and stopped out at the hotel for a visit. The Huntington was a meeting place for many Iowans. The Happel family were there and have a moment with Bill in the garden. Provost Harvey Davis presents president of the Tournament of Roses John Davidson, a Schaefer pen desk set. And Dr. Breckler presents Leigh Leishman, a similar desk set, to the courtesy of the Schaefer Pen Company, a token of appreciation from Iowa for the wonderful Tournament of Roses hospitality. The relaxation periods were fun and exciting, but a lot of hard work. Governor Hoig stopped at the practice field. Our Hawks had come into this season rated no better than seventh in the conference. They beat Indiana 27-0 at Bloomington, edged the Oregon State Beavers 14-13 in Iowa City, beat a dangerous Wisconsin 11-13-7. A 34-0 win over Hawaii sent us headlong into a tough Purdue team at Lafayette. A 17-14 setback by Michigan provided the necessary impetus to stun the Gophers 7-0 at Minnesota, and a great team effort blanked the Buckeyes 6-0 and put the Hawks in the Rose Bowl. A Michigan win over Ohio State gave us an undisputed Big Ten title, a feat not enjoyed at Iowa since 1921. And now it's nearing game time in California. Practice weary but proud of their record, and dearly wanting a Rose Bowl win, our Hawks have completed their practice sessions. They held the annual Winter Iowa picnic this year in Pasadena at Brookside Park. The date was December 31st. The picnic was moved into Pasadena for the first time, permitting everyone to be nearer the hub of activity. Names of the various counties were nailed on trees for identification, and Iowans renewed old friendships and the Rose Bowl game and the Iowa team were the main topics of conversation. They were all proud of the Iowa team. They were anxious to see them on New Year's Day. And we were getting anxious too. Finally, the day of the Roses Parade, this year named Famous Firsts. An estimated million were on hand. The Rose Queen and Court, Leading the majestic array of 63 flower-covered floats was Rose Queen Anne Mossberg and her six princesses. The seven beauties are seated amidst more than 10,000 roses. What a thrill when the University of Iowa band marched by under the direction of Fred Ebbs. Their trip to the Tournament of Roses was sponsored by Oldsmobile. The Big Ten float heralds the members of this great conference as being first in teaching, research, and service. The colorful Scottish Highlanders of the State University of Iowa under Pipe Major Bill Adamson. And from San Antonio, Texas, a float heralding their forthcoming Fiesta in April and famed night parade known as Fiesta Flambeau. That's a Texas gal, too. Tournament First Ladies. This float honors three past Rose Queens. On the bottom row is Mrs. Hallie McConnell, formerly of Esterville, Iowa, and last year's queen, lovely Joan Culver. Keokuk, Iowa makes its first appearance in Rose Bowl pageantry with a salute to Indian Chief Keokuk, the first citizen of Iowa. In front is a floral hawk, symbolic of Iowa's football team. The maidens are Keokuk girls. The city of Whittier features a stork, stork eggs with a pretty princess emerging from each. And finally, a queen on her throne. Strength from the land, the state of Iowa enters its first float in parade history, declaring Iowa to be first in agriculture, leaders in industry, foremost in education. Six Iowa co-eds and Mrs. Iowa of 1957, Mrs. R.J. Furlick, of Carroll. First in beauty, the city of Long Beach features Miss Universe of 57, lovely Carol Morris, 20-year-old beauty from Ottumwa, Iowa. Miss Universe and her four attendants, who are Long Beach girls, are protected by an Arabian canopy dais. This parade has no equal.
And now the huge Rose Bowl is rapidly filling to near capacity. This is it, the State University of Iowa Hawkeyes, undisputed champs of the Big Ten Conference. The 11th meeting in this big pack. And to start things rolling, the marching bands ramble down the field to help build up the suspense and the excitement. The colorful Highlanders make their appearance on the Rose Bowl turf. And the Grand Marshal of the Tournament of Roses, the famed Eddie Rickenbacker. The gracious Queen and her court are presented to the crowd just before kickoff time. And now the University of Iowa team takes the field. And what a thrill this was. Co-captains Dick Deasy and Don Suki of Iowa meet for the coin toss with Jerry Laird and Dick Corrick of Oregon State. Oregon State won and chose to receive the final huddle before kickoff time and a cheer for the University of Iowa Hawkeyes. Well, on the third play of the game, Barry picks up about seven yards, fumbles. Gilliam of Iowa recovers in the Iowa 40-yard line, and it's first and 10 Iowa. And on the first play from scrimmage, Don Debrino picks up about three yards over right guard. Two plays later, Kenny Plain passes to Jim Gibbons to the Oregon State 46, and it's a first down Iowa. After running, Play loses three yards in a second and 13 situation. Plain rolls out to the right, hips the ball, swings inside a defensive left end, runs down the sidelines, reverses, loses balance, rights himself, and with the help of key blocks by Klein and Gibbons, moves into the end zone for the Hawkeyes' first touchdown, a tremendous 49-yard gallop. The crowd rose en masse to cheer the Hawkeyes. In the third quarter with Iowa leading 21 to six, Kenny Plain shows a nifty bit of faking and determined running to turn a sure loss into a nice, neat gain. On the next play, Mike Hagler rams into left tackle, picks up about two yards. And then with a second and eight yard to go situation, Hagler moves on a play that went from plane to Debrinader. He cuts over the left side, swings to his right, and outruns as speedy Oregon State backs for a sensational 66-yard run for a touchdown. This was Mike's second mark of the afternoon, and the final score ended Iowa 35, Oregon State 19. Well, even before the game was completed, they tore the goalpost down, and many an Iowa souvenir hunter was satisfied this day. A tremendous climax to the old gold rush of 57, when an estimated 30,000 Iowans were present for the great gold strike they'd all been seeking, victory in the Rose Bowl. While there will be long-lasting memories for the football boys and staff and the entire party who made the trip to this greatest of American festivals, the Tournament of Roses, this Iowa team upheld the tradition of the Big Ten Conference in grand style by the excellence of their play, their conduct on the coast. Hundreds of thousands of Iowans thrilled to their victory, as did millions of others through television and radio who heard Iowa University of Iowa, and indeed, for all Iowans, everywhere. January 1st, 1957.